all of this is such great information. And I really hope that as we are, you know, as people are listening, as we are given this, this information, uh, for those that are watching, that it really is helping, uh, that it opens up some kind of grace within people, some kind of hope as well. I think that's the most important. The, the number one message from this is that there is hope and there's a way out that suicide essentially is not the answer and it can be prevented. I want us now to wrap up or at least get into the last part of our segment, uh, talking to those who can help, you know, mm -hmm. what are the warning signs in the situations where help can be offered, what to look for, how do you know, as you, you mentioned, um, when someone is just is is having is grappling with actually attempting in like the mental health field um we think about warning signs um i think i saw a statistic once that said that you know 80 percent of people who attempt suicide have shown some sort of warning sign prior to the attempt and so i think about warning signs really as an invitation to ask the questions. Mm -hmm. So warning signs and risk factors are very different. Warning signs are things that people do say, maybe how they look, we'll go through them a little bit more specifically, before that make you as their friend, loved one, somebody who knows them as a professional, whoever it is go, huh, is that person okay? So like the moment you have that sense, ask. Mm -hmm. It's an invitation to ask the questions. And so more specifically, we can think about warning signs using the acronym FACTS. F is for feelings. So if someone's feeling hopeless, if they're expressing that they're feeling hopeless, um, ask the questions. Hey, I noticed you said that. Are you feeling okay? Are you doing okay? Um, A is for actions. So if they're doing anything, that's a high-risk behavior. If they're self-harming in some way, if they are you know, maybe they were sober and then they have fallen off the wagon and now they're using again. Any sort of action that's concerning, um, again, it's an invitation to ask the questions. C of facts is for any changes. So looking for any changes in someone's sleep, in their appetite, in their behaviors, um, any really sudden changes or things that maybe have increased in frequency. Again, there's just sort of that moment of pause that you're like, huh, you doing okay? Ask the question. And then T is for threats. So if they're threatening suicide, if they're talking about suicide, if they're making any plans for suicide and they're expressing these things to you, take that as an invitation to ask the question, are you actually thinking about harming yourself? Do you have a plan? Um, and then S is for situations. So any sort of stressful situation, any sense of loss, whether that's loss of a loved one, loss of a job, loss of housing, COVID took a lot from people and there is a, an extreme sense of loss that came with that. And so these are situations that we just really want to pay attention to and check in on people. So these warning signs, we can really think about as invitations to ask the questions, to check in with them. And so as a friend, a family member, as somebody who is looking out for those, once you've identified those and somebody has asked the, or, and you've asked the questions, you know, are you feeling suicidal? There are specific screening tools, which are basically questionnaires that you can ask. There's one that is sort of the gold standard, a best practice of care. It's called the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, which I know is a mouthful and kind of hard to remember. So we'll definitely link to it. But this was designed for the everyday person. This was not designed specifically for mental health providers. It's a very simple six question questionnaire that gives you the questions to ask mm -hmm. that you can then go through and ask your loved one and assess their level of risk of self-harm or suicide. And then at that point, You've kind of gone through this process. You've expressed to your loved one your concern for them. And then you can take action. And by taking action, I mean you're not leaving them alone if you have a safety concern. You may be seeking um, professional care 
taking them to an emergency department, taking them to their primary care doctor, taking them somewhere where they can then be further assessed for their safety. We don't want to leave anybody alone. Um, we also want to minimize access to any lethal methods. So if there's anything in the home or in the environment that they could harm themselves with, we want to eliminate their access to it. Like I mentioned earlier, these um, urges and thoughts of suicide can, um, it's like a wave, right? And so we want to help get people through the wave and eliminate access to anything that they could do impulsively in the moment. Mm -hmm. Another resource that can be really helpful is contacting a crisis hotline with them. And so it's not just you trying to assess them on your own and like, I don't even know, I can't remember what that screener was, right? It's kind of like, I'm not sure. You can also reach out to a crisis hotline and get connected with a trained professional who can help you through the steps of assessing your loved one's safety. And then in situations where, let's say, you know, people think, okay, well, I may, may be able to get this person help but they don't necessarily, because, you know, money is a barrier. I think people think that mental health and all these resources to get better are so far away and they cost a lot, right? Mm -hmm. so outside of, I know you mentioned a resource that's available online just now, but in the moment, are there very simple, inexpensive practices or things that uh, people can do to help those that are, 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 are grappling? So all of the crisis hotlines are free. Um, and so people can access those completely free. Oftentimes they're anonymous as well. Um, now, if somebody reaches to the point where their safety is in imminent danger, um, then you know the crisis hotline has protocols to make sure that that person is safe. Um, but generally speaking, all of the resources I've mentioned thus far are free of cost. Okay. And they're all readily available online. Is there anything that we can leave them with? Things to say, things not to say. Take it seriously. Every time somebody is talking about suicide, take it seriously. Even if it's the hundredth time that they've mentioned it, always take it seriously. I work a lot with, with young people, with teens and young adults. And so I hear a lot from parents like, oh, she's just doing it for attention, right? And my response to that is, then let's give her attention. These are people seeking support, right? Like they want, they, they're they taking it to an extreme maybe, but that means that they're that much more in need of it. People are often seeking support and if they're not getting it, right, they might escalate their requests because they are actually having that feeling. Whether or not they're gonna take action we're not sure, right? But if they're asking for support and they're expressing that to us, we want to take it seriously. We want to offer that support. We want to provide them with that sense of they're not alone and that when they ask for help, they get it. Just thinking as a person, uh, you know, that that may, that has been support for people. You know, I get through, I get many requests um, as to what to say or have people who have friends that are, are grappling and they ask me what to, to do. And often, even in my own field with having the knowledge that I have, sometimes I do feel powerless because every situation is different and you just don't know who you're talking to and if what you're going to say will actually help. But I think knowing what not to say is really, really important. So are there, is there anything that you can, can just leave people with as to what not to say? Something that you said that's really important is that there isn't like this one magical phrase to say that's going to resonate with everybody, right? Every situation is different. And I think when somebody is seeking support from you and you don't know what to say, it's okay to say that. It's okay. Oftentimes my number one thing that I say is, thank you so much for sharing that with me. I'm so glad that you told me because when somebody is talking about it, they, in that moment, they also could have not talked about it, right? They could have skipped right to taking action, which is what we don't want. And so really providing a safe space for them to talk about how they're feeling to, you know, really stay as calm as you can, recognizing that this is hard 
And you may say, I don't know what to say, but I want to help you get help. Yeah. And and oftentimes presence as well. Just you being present with someone through a situation can can do wonders for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because when somebody is feeling suicidal, they feel extremely isolated and alone. Yeah. And like nobody in the world can understand. And the fact that they're reaching out to you and asking you for support, just being there with them yeah. can be so impactful and helping them with the next step, right? And that next step might be contacting a crisis hotline together so that then you know what the next step and the next step and the next step are um, and making sure that they're safe in the moment. And so sometimes that will require going to an emergency department or sometimes that will require making an appointment with their medical doctor or with a therapist in the community so that they get that connection that's more than just you. We really want to help build their their safety net. Uh, there are, I, I listened to a talk of a friend recently, given sharing their experience with suicidal ideations. And she mentioned that the truth is that no one would have known. She did not give any signs. She, she said that she did very well in ensuring that people didn't know that she was sad or that she was dealing with something. Uh, and she said the only person that she had allowed to probably see would have been her mom. And that was a decision that she made, that she allowed her mom to see, but not that she told her directly. She just was being her, her sad self in front of her mom. And so I wanted to touch on that because we just spoke about identifying signs and ways to help but what what do we and, and I think it's important to understand that it's really critical for us as human beings to just be very compassionate as we move through life because in the instances where people aren't showing signs you can't possibly know what people are dealing with just in your day-to-day -day interactions just a loving voice or a compassionate word or presence or softness could could be the thing that saves someone's life speaking from my own personal experience growing up it's very shameful right and so you keep it hidden you keep it a secret no one would have known that I was struggling at home that I had all these other things going on and you know you sort of keep it like you don't, in my family, the whole saying was you don't air your dirty laundry, right? You don't talk about the things going on behind closed doors. And it sounds similar in that situation. And that's why it's so important to stay connected, to ask the questions, to check on your friends and your family members, even if they look like they're doing great from the outside, right? Because if we don't ask, we don't know, and we're making assumptions. And that is where it can get really, really dangerous. We want to make sure we're asking. We want to make sure that we are coming from a place of compassion and just really checking in in a really authentic way of connecting with somebody so that if they are struggling, right, they might see that as an opportunity to let their guard down, to let you in. Thank you, Heath. I think this work is I mean, it's, I, I'm so honored to know you and to have observed you, you know, in your various roles. But I think this work is so, so, so important, especially now uh, in the times that we're in. I, you know, we've been through the pandemic, as you mentioned, it took a lot from people. Uh, but even beyond that, I don't think it's over. I think in many ways, people are still recovering, still trying to figure it out. They, they don't, can't necessarily put their finger on what the thing is. Uh, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of fog, and uh, I just want to encourage everyone here to, uh, to know within themselves that there's hope, and that mm -hmm. there is, you know, there is always light at the end of the tunnel, there is always light, and you know, as someone myself, I've, I've suffered multiple losses at a very young age, I've had to come through. And even now in my adulthood, I, I think I've gone through very dark periods as well. And 
the thing that keeps me going is my self-worth. I've really come to a place where I understand that just by living and just by breathing, uh, my breath is a miracle and, um, and you know, I'm, I'm worthy of something and I don't have the answers today, but I'll, I'll find the answers. Uh, one of my favorite phrases is everything is figure outable. Yes. I love that people are talking more about mental health. I love that people are talking more about their personal experiences as well, because, you know, just that lightens the load. Thank you for having this conversation. Thank you for talking. But is there anything that you would like to leave in this space? Is there any message that you would like to just share to anyone who might be watching? You know, suicide is a really complex topic and it's really, really challenging. And I think all of us have the ability to create a sense of of hope and community with our loved ones. And so just know that you're not alone. Um, and yeah, it's just been a true honor to be here to talk about this today. It's a topic that is near and dear to my heart and yeah, I just really appreciate it. Thank you.